I mean, we get submissions all the time. The door is pretty much always open. So we basically just develop this queue over time that we then have to go through. And we usually go through it in the order that it comes in. And we're thinking about, you know, do we like it aesthetically? Uh, do we feel some connection to it musically? And we think about things like, is there some hole in either the marketplace or our catalog that could be well served by taking a piece like that? And then we have to kind of weigh other considerations like, you know, the types of instrumentation called for, personnel, and all of that just kind of goes in to the melting pot of subjectivity that is, you know, how we decide. We're over 20 years old now, and we do have some objective thought processes that we've developed over the years that allow us to make you know, reasonably intelligent decisions about which pieces to take, but a lot of it still is very subjective. When we try to bring our best selves to that process, we want to make sure that we're giving each piece good, thoughtful consideration because these people who are submitting, um, it's a big deal to them, and we know that, you know, and we've been on that side in various ways in the past, um, so we try to take it seriously and we try to give everybody everybody's music thoughtful consideration right when we accept a piece that's when we contact the author um, we send them a contract we discuss details we collect all their you know the assets for the piece in most cases there's going to be some sort of a notation file most often that's going to be either a Sibelius file or finale uh, sometimes Dorico program notes usually give some insight into the intent behind a, a, a given piece performance notes you know uh, are certain mallets required? Are there certain uh, unusual techniques that might come into play? Are there certain things the conductor might need to know to make it a make for a better performance? Setup diagram, even if it's just a sketch on a napkin, will make it look pretty, but knowing how the intended plot on stage is supposed to look uh, can be helpful. Some sort of an audio recording. Those can come in all sorts of flavors. A lot of times it'll be a live recording or a video. Having an audible reference that represents your music in, in its best light can definitely help us to make it shine. Anybody can enter notes into Finale or Sibelius, but to really follow practical guidelines in terms of uh, engraving styles and what's readable in terms of how many notes you want to fit onto a page and, and where page turns go and things like that, there's, there's really a, a whole art behind that that we're lucky enough to have a great team that considers all these things so that by the time composers receive their proofs now, usually it's just a couple little tweaks here and there and it's, it's pretty good to go. Behind that is really, it's a multi-pass process. There's usually like a primary engraver and they're kind of like the lead on the piece, but then there's other people on the team that will then look at it and do what we call an in-house or an internal proofing. They'll be looking at it with completely fresh eyes and they'll find all sorts of stuff that the primary lead may not have. And so it turns into a dialogue. And so there's usually two to three sets of hands on any given piece by the time it's actually gotten to the composer. And even prior to any engraving work, there's usually an editorial pass that someone will do. Well, they'll, they'll go through it with sort of a zoomed out perspective. Because our, our concern is that when somebody gets it, when somebody buys a piece from us, that all of those things have been thought through. And there's no little unpleasant surprises like, oh, I see that this calls for a, a bass marimba and it wasn't advertised as such and we don't have that, would the composer accept uh, substitution notes in the score? Would they be open to that? Could these disparate percussion staves be combined into one staff to save space? Would it add some accessibility out there for the end users? So those are all things that we're thinking about, you know, in a sort of an editorial pass before it even goes to an engraver. <laughs> Yeah, so after we've basically finished the heavy lifting on the production process, it's time to get to the, the final details of proofing. And there's a couple parts of that process. Uh, one of those is that we send everything to a sort of a third party proofreader, which is, you know, it's essential. There's always a, a bunch of stuff that she'll catch. The other thing is that we always obviously send the music to the composer so they can actually make sure it meets their needs. It's their music. Part of that process is we create what's called a pitch proof. We've learned that like through the course of the engraving process, every so often a slip of the mouse or a slip of the arrow key, it can nudge a note up or down or remove an accidental un unintentionally. So we'll usually strip out anything that's unpitched and just send that to the composer so they can actually listen to the audio just from a pitch standpoint that's just straight out of the engraving file. So we'll send the full score with all its front matter, the setup diagram, you know, cover art in its full layout, the way it's gonna be presented. Uh, we'll send the full set of parts as well. Once the author has signed off on it, we're basically 
charging towards the finish line and we have a big list of criteria. It's like, did we spell the composer's name right? Everywhere that it appears, it appears on the first page of music, it, it appears on the cover, it appears on every single part, it appears in the copyright notice. We have a list of every place that that one composer name appears and we go check every single one of those. Same with the copyright year, same with the item number, did we put the header on every page where it's supposed to go? I'd say like at least half of the time, there's a fair amount of stuff that we'll catch in there that needs fixing. So that final pass before it goes out the door, we'll, we'll usually, usually catch a few last little ticks and we can really just polish everything up. Once a piece is released, we usually aren't done with our work on it yet. And we send it off for review to percussive notes, usually send the actual original composer a couple of copies. We have what's called a new issue program, which is basically a select number of dealers right off the bat. A handful of, of new pieces go off uh, for sale to those dealers. We have to get the piece onto as many state lists as we can. And then from there, we're, we're always looking for performances of works on YouTube. We're always hungry for good footage of a piece that we can use to to market it and to bring it into our website or le at least link to it on our website or through social media, again, to increase that exposure. So the work really never stops once a piece is released. It just changes the type of work that we do, the form of it changes, but we're still working to increase exposure. We'll also register anything we publish with ASCAP or sometimes BMI, but um, it depends on the performance rights organization that the composer is a member of. We encourage all our composers to become members of a performance rights organization because that gives them the opportunity to earn royalties from that. So we always encourage that, uh, but that is something that we maintain on our end as the publisher as well. Yeah, so in terms of submitting pieces for publication, uh, from our standpoint, uh, there are certain things that can be done that make it more likely to be taken, I guess, seriously. You can sort of tell uh, when you're looking at a score where the person is coming from in terms of their attention to detail. Because of all the steps that we have to take to bring a piece from start to finish, the more detail that's been put in by the arranger, the composer, to begin with, it makes a huge difference. Sometimes you can look at a piece and it's really, it's less of a clear statement and it's more of just a vague idea. It doesn't give us a clear picture of what it's actually going to be. Along with that, the recording that is submitted, I mean, that's pretty much a prerequisite now. It's like you have to have a recording of some type. It has to be something that we can listen to or watch. Video is the, the most ideal way, but video with terrible audio, uh, it's, you know, it might not be the best. So you really wanna, you wanna put your best foot forward. And we do actually require certain, you know, like a minimal amount of text with the submission, like things like program notes and performance notes. It would be nice to know that you've actually thought of these things. It could be anecdotes about the inspiration for it. It could be you know, some background about the original composer, if it's a piece of public domain classical music that you're arranging, whatever it may be. The way that you write those notes actually says a lot too. I think a lot of what you're speaking to is not unlike if you're applying for a new job and you're, you're going to submit a resume or a cover letter, you know, you want that to be well written. You want it to be sussed out. You want it to be proofread. Maybe this is stating the obvious, but I think I think all of those things that Murray is talking about, they apply whether or not you're going to publish the piece. I mean, if you're arranging music or composing music and your intent is to have human beings play that music, then why wouldn't you want it to be really clearly laid out in the part so that it's easy, as easy as possible for those performers to actually interpret your message? Sometimes it takes extra work, but it's work that helps your creative ideas come to life. So I always encourage people to like improve their engraving skills. I mean, we're doing it all the time. It's just one of those things that you have to continue honing. You have to make sure that the music communicates to the musicians on the page. And in a perfect world, you will have done that prior to actually submitting it for publication because because otherwise it's really just basically a first draft, right? There is a flip side to that coin. If you're not a computer person and you're not good with Finale or Sibelius, and you know, there are still plenty of us out there that are, you know, that are not great with software tools, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't submit. You know, if you can put together a great recording that speaks to your music, that is something that we will still be interested in taking a, a look at and a listen to.
If you're sending us an arrangement of a piece that is not yet in the public domain, which is basically anything after the year like 1922 or something like that, there's a good chance that that's going to be a harder sell for us because there's a whole scope of red tape that that requires for us to get print licensing from the actual copyright holder and continue to maintain over the course of the years if it's a piece that we're going to put out. So it's not a deal breaker, but it's it's definitely a harder sell because um, they just take a lot more kind of upkeep. We don't usually have time to provide feedback on submissions. Occasionally, when we reject something, it's for a very specific reason, like this seems cool, but you know we're not sure that this is uh, you know fully baked as is, and it would be great to see a live video of this so we could see it actually being played by humans. So in some cases, we've let folks know that hey, if you have the chance to record this, uh, like in the fall or in the spring or next year or something like that and you want to resubmit it, we'd be happy to take another look because we just can't, we don't feel we can make a call. But usually those cases are kind of few and far between. In most cases, if we feel it's not right, we'll probably feel that way, you know, for the same reasons in the next month down the road. We can make their music shine with some of the best of them. You know, we will make sure that your piece comes out sparkling clean and that we've thought of all of the things for the end user that they will want to have thought about for their music. We will care for their music just about as much, if not equally, to the way we'd care about our own music. It can take a little longer sometimes. When, when we accept a piece, you know, it might not come out for a few months, but um, I think it also speaks to the care that we try to put into every piece too. Everything gets the, uh, the personal touch. We do really take that seriously because it's, it's something we take great pride in. Our thought is that it's worth the wait. We don't want to just churn stuff out just to have quantity over quality. I think it's, um, it's always important to, to put your best foot forward. That counts for us as, as a publisher as well. Here's up, here's down. Here's up, here's down. Good boy. Is that an actual trick he knows? No. <laughs> it's just <laughs> his way of reacting to the world, basically. <laughs> I think it's just a coincidence. Oh, buddy, yes, very good, very good.